Thank you, Mark. We truly appreciate the opportunity to join you and the entire AFTO community today to talk about a topic uh, near and dear to our heart uh, and to all of us. Um, so Thomas and I are going to tag team today. Um, if we then move to the next uh, slide. So first of all, we wanted to give you a sense of the, the scope of the topic that we'd like to talk to. First of all, we're going to give a little bit more background on Thomas and I's uh, role. We're going to talk about concepts, standards, where digital technology is today. We spend quite a bit of time on interoperability, which is a key concept that we want to make all of you um, have a deep understanding on and what that means uh, to the end-to-end -end supply chain. We also want to talk a little bit more about how this looks like in the future, specifically for your roles uh, and your day-to-day -day life. And then we'll wrap up hopefully with uh, 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A so you can ask us any questions that you have um, on the top of your mind. So that's what we'd like to cover today. I know we have a, a short uh, one hour time frame, um, but we'll try to get through as much as we can uh, and give you a nice solid grounding in where traceability conversation is today. So next is, you know, webinars are always great to be able to put a name and a face together. So there you see a picture of myself. I come to IFT about a year ago uh, after a 20 plus year career in the food uh, CPG industry across Procter & Gamble and PepsiCo in various different roles of product process quality uh, development type of roles, commercializing new products and new technologies to the marketplace. Thomas, how about you go ahead and introduce a little bit more about yourself? Thanks, Brian. Um, so here's my headshot so you have an idea of what I look like. I do wish I had taken my uh, gotten a haircut before I took this picture, but there's, there's me. I have a background in microbiology and epidemiology um, and currently pursuing further education in food science. I kind of uh, found this niche in food traceability research and um, early implementation and standardization. Um, I uh, was involved in um, traceback investigations while at the Georgia Department of Agriculture and their food safety division. And I really saw a, um, a need for improving end-to-end -end traceability capabilities. And I've, um, at the moment now, I uh, lead interoperability work for the Global Dialogue CP Traceability, which I'll kind of go into a little bit more detail how that applies more broadly to enabling um, better traceability systems. But yeah, just a brief bio on me, and I'm going to hand it back off to Brian so he can uh, start us off here. Sure. So we thought we'd give a little bit of background on IFT and how that fits into the traceability space. So first of all, a little bit about IFT. So IFT is a 15,000 member, uh, individual member community uh, focused on the science of food, delivering safe, nutritious, and sustainable uh, food supplies to the world. IFT and traceability sp specifically has a you know 12-year history going back to the partnerships between IFT and the FDA in preparation for the creation and rollout of FISMA. As you can see on the slide here, multiple year engagements uh, with contract work with the FDA, convening experts across the, um, multiple stakeholder groups uh, to conduct you know, pilot uh, traceback investigations and identifying some recommendations uh, that ultimately were uh, put into the Section 204 uh, regulation. After we did that work, we transitioned somewhat into a, a, a partnership um, working specifically in the seafood traceability space. We chose seafood for multiple reasons uh, that we'll get to in a little bit deeper into the uh, later in the presentation, but the complexity, uh, global scale, and the, uh, the use cases that were of need there really sought us to, uh, to choose trace, uh, seafood as a um, commodity of interest that we would put our focus on. Speaking of use cases, <coughs> excuse me, on the next slide, I'll try to summarize this in a couple different ways. You know, many of us think of traceability as focused on recall management uh, and the food safety aspects of that. But ultimately, trace, traceability systems and the backbone of information that they create have a lot of different use cases, including sustainability, fighting fraud, legality, provenance, and chain of custody. We believe that all of this ladders up to higher order consumer needs, such as trust and transparency, and having confidence in their food supply that they're um, getting the food that they purchase and that it's safe for them and their families to use. Just want to ground a little bit of you know, everyone in the case of where, um, where traceability data can be used. 
now that we're going to go in a little bit deeper into concepts and other areas, I'm going to take, hand it off to uh, Thomas uh, to take you into the next layer of depth. Thomas, take it away. Right, thanks, Brian. Uh, so uh, we're going to first start talking about traceability concepts. And I kind of want to pre preface this discussion with this is how we have seen traceability evolve and how uh, businesses currently think about traceability um, when they're thinking about enabling um, better traceback mechanisms and also um, ad addressing those use cases that Brian had talked about. Um, there's been, because of the spark in you know, possibilities in digital technology, there's been all sorts of um, use cases that have been, um, have been played with and have been having early implementation that go beyond uh, food safety. So I want to kind of center some of the concepts on what our business is thinking about when they're thinking about traceability and how that, how that applies to traceback investigations and what you may be um, using um, in, your, um, in your familiarity with trace traceability. So here's kind of what the current paradigm is, is one up, one down traceability. It comes out of the um, 2002 Anti-Bioterror Act um, where um, we needed to have a rec record keeping um, requirement so that there can be uh, the ability to uh, easily trace back or to facilitate trace back investigation in the event of a, um, a, a food uh, emergency. So, um, you know, this is kind of displaying the uh, kind of what the scenario is, you know, practically from a systems design point of view. So because you have basically the record keeping components of that you're keeping the records on your customers and on your um, suppliers, you end up having uh, unique uh, critical junctures where that you that are um, you have special relationships between them. You may have actually a different um, way of keeping that information depending on uh, what your relationship is. So you end up having all of these types of relationships that you're managing just on uh, this single supply chain node. This kind of works when, uh, for internal traceability purposes, but when you are needing to connect the dots across, um, you know, across the supply chain, especially if you need to have origin data, um, it you have a quite a bit of problems because it, you're actually having to connect this situation multiple times. And in food supply chains, it, you can actually have quite a few different nodes. You can have um, fragmented um, um, supply chains. You can have um, varied different uh, ways of uh, keeping this information. I mean, it, the way you keep the information, especially with paper records, might be dependent on a particular person knowing where it is. So um, it's, it, um, it isn't really effective for a lot of use cases and traceability that we had talked about earlier, especially when you're thinking about traceback investigations, where if you have a perishable food, you need to be able to know when that, you know, um, you know where in the supply chain that potentially a uh, compromised product sits as fast as possible. So if you are even waiting a few hours at each of the supply chain junctions, um, the critical tracking events, it still can end up being a um, prohibitive amount of time to be effective in a trace back and then subsequent trace forward investigation. So this is kind of the vision of what the future of traceability should be, is end-to-end -end traceability. This is really, uh, there's some misconceptions about what end-to-end -end traceability really means, but what um, what we're really entailing is a you know industry-wide or sector-wide approach to being able to enable the connection points to trace uh, back products all the way to the source. So this is more than just requiring food companies to keep information on their um, on their uh, customers and on their suppliers. It's also um, really kind of mandating a standardized way of housing this information and setting up you know interoperability and data query mechanisms so that you can facilitate this trace back even among disparate information systems so when you're designing you know a large scale system like this this is kind of like a system of systems really right you're wanting to kind of hone in on the core components of what you need to know and what you need to design around so there's a couple of different um groups of concepts here that I've combined into one slide. You have um, the key data elements in critical tracking events, and these are concepts that were created by the Global Food Traceability Center in understanding how to provide recommendations uh, to the FDA um, when implementing FISMA's Section 204 provision. 
Um, and then we also have three other concepts on um, that are really come from GS1 um, on product identity. So um, I'll, I'll actually now go into detail on all of these. So key data elements, these are the key pieces of information that need to be collected at each uh, juncture of the supply chain so that you can address the use case. So for food safety, the, this may just be, um, you know, information on, you know, where the, the who, what, where, when, and why of the product so you can do an effective recall. But if you're thinking about it also in terms of food quality or if you're thinking about it in terms of sustainability, you may be uh, capturing other data elements. Um, so, for instance, when we work in seafood, um, catch area is very important because companies are also concerned about uh, potentially illegally caught product entering their supply chain and them being responsible for it. So they may have, you know, a catch area or they may have um, the gear type or something like that. So um, other key data elements can include, you know, temperature readings, humidity, that sort of thing that um, may also be um, aiding a particular company's uh, quality indexes. So um, critical tracking events are thought are in work in conjunction with key data elements. So these are the critical junctures that I was talking about where you need to track the KDEs in order to address your use cases as well. So not every event that happens in a logistical uh, supply chain may be necessary to be captured for traceability reasons. So, um, and it depends on what your use case is um, that you are designing your traceability system around. Um, for, um, for recall purposes, it's really being able to know when and where the product is. Um, and so really it's kind of centered on chain of custody, but for other uh, use cases you may have, um, you may have other CTEs. Um, these are broadly grouped into um, commissioning events, thing, the origin of a food product, you know, the harvesting um, of the base ingredient, uh, transformation, which takes inputs of um, particular logistical units and transforms them into an additional one. So this is usually a processing step of some sort. Um, also, aggregation events can take on this form or commingling events, I'm sorry, not, not aggregation. And then depletion is also the, the consumption of the product. And then the other three concepts that are really core are um, identification, capturing that identification, and sharing that identification of that product identity. So um, what is very um, important to end-to-end -end traceability is the ability to have a, a globally unique um, uh, identification schema. So um, for um, companies that work um, in the processor sector forward to, to the retailer, they tend to use, um, and there's wide, especially in the United States, there's wide scale adoption of GS1 standards for product identity. This includes things like G10s, um, serialized G10s, SFCCs for containers, um, and then also having uh, like GLNs, the global location number for registering um, locations. And these are captured through a variety of mechanisms. These are the familiar barcodes um, that can take on the form of uh, data, data bars or GS1128 case labels, um, or they also can take the form of QR codes. And then also in the emerging spaces, uh, using RFIDs for ca uh, capturing this information. Um, there needs to be a way to basically link the digital and physical realms, and that's what this capture um, segment really um, entails. And then the sharing platform, and this is the sharing of uh, business information across supply chain partners um, and ensuring that, uh, it's, that information is kept on a need-to-know basis, but it is readily accessible in the cases of um, the need for the traceability information. Um, in data sharing, there's a balance between what should be visible and what is business sensitive, and um, uh, that is uh, it, it is uh, it's still being explored in what the proper balance is. But uh, and and especially in end-to-end -end traceability schemas. But um, it is um, yeah. Anyway, so moving on, uh, this is kind of when we're conceptualizing. Traceability is the design elements. Um, we basically put KDEs and CTEs in a matrix where we have the who, what, where, when, and why uh, along the rows, and then um, columns of each of the critical tracking events that, uh, that happen. This has been very useful because it can help you figure out and conceptualize what needs to be captured at each of the CTEs and what the, um, because odds are you are already collecting that each of the supply chain partners are capturing this information. Um, 
but it may not be complete on what they have available. This also allows you to understand what format they may be. So some of these records may be digitized, some of these records may be paper-based. Um, and it allows you to um, devise a process flow for the products that you're trying to uh, initiate a traceability information, a traceability system in, and um, allows you to kind of make strategic choices on technology adoption, identi picking identifiers, and figuring out which KDEs need to be collected. So I'm going to, um, after uh, talking about the, the core concepts to traceability and the, the basic vocabulary words that we use in uh, the traceability space, I want to kind of talk about how current traceability is a challenge um, and uh, what are some of the drivers towards what the current trends you may be seeing in, um, in government along traceability. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about, I mean, it's kind of in broad swath, but about um, historical trends. but just in general, we are, you know, seeing, you know, localization of um, production of various commodities, and because of that, we also have extensive distribution networks to being able to deliver those um, those goods to the consumer um, readily available and cheaply. So th uh, there's been a lot of choices that we have made in order to make this possible. We end up having fairly complex supply chains. We have um, aggregation and commingling events that can make trace back to the source difficult. And we also, um, because of the way the industry uh, sits and because of the various players on their, those stakeholders' needs, we have um, disparate information systems where some people may be relying very much on paper records still, some are looking at you know, um, fully digitized blockchain-based systems, and so you have kind of a variability in adoption. Um, so that current landscape can be quite tricky to navigate because when you're designing a system-wide system, you know you are having to anticipate and um, design around those those variabilities of heterogeneity. Um, and then also, I kind of wanted to, to speak to some of the scientific and outbreak trends. Um, so methods in you know that often when we're thinking about traceback investigations, we're thinking about kind of three principal stools. So there's uh or, or in food safety emergencies, we're thinking about three principal stool legs. Uh, we're thinking about uh, lab results, we're thinking about the epidemiology, linking the lab results to the um to the vehicle, and then we're also um then doing the traceback uh investigation to identify the convergence point and to be able to trace forward and understand where the um potentially uh, the potentially contaminated product may be so that it can be removed from the, sh the shelves or removed from the supply chain um, to, uh, to protect consumers. Um, so what we have seen in general is that, you know, lab techniques and epidemiology have generally continued to improve and continue to be able to um, discover, um, you know, lower and lower case count um, outbreaks. We're able to um, with whole genome sequencing, we're able to more easily link um, laboratory results with each other. With previously, with um, you know, with uh, pulse electrophoresis, we were you know uh, matching up uh, uh, PFGE patterns, and we sometimes had false links and sometimes uh, missed links. But with WGS, we're much more able to um, um, we're much more able to uh, identify uh, outbreaks as they're occurring and um, long-term outbreaks as well. Um, and then epidemiology also continues to improve and so, so as um, data collection and um, also the, the clinical realities are changing too. The, uh, physicians are much, able, much better able to test for a variety of uh, potential pathogens and also increasing the detection. And then uh, on kind of the more human side of, the, of this coin where we've seen um, you know, social media really amplifying outbreak messages, um, people being very cognizant of it and being able to share information very rapidly. Um, and this has, a, can have a greater reputational risk to uh, companies. And then, um, you know, with those two um, identifications of uh, outbreaks happening easier, uh, much more robust and immediate data access is really necessary for uh, a, uh, an effective traceback response. So, um, I kind of want to, I um, just to do a little bit of a time check. Yeah, so I, I'm going to kind of quickly go through the Romaine, one of the Romaine, uh, uh, the outbreaks of E. coli 0157 in Romaine last year, 
This is the one that um, came out of Huma. Um, this, uh, and just kind of illustrate how this is really showcasing why traceability is so important. And we have such a, um, you know, we have a challenge in front of us. Um, as I said, it was a very widespread um, multi-state outbreak um, with very serious illnesses with 45 uh, with HUS. Um, the, they could not pinpoint a single grower, processor, harvester, distributor. There was not, um, as I show later here, there was not a convergence point um, that they were able to identify in their various trace back investigations. So they had to broad, they were able to, uh, they didn't know what the, you know, what the pathogen was. They did know, they did also know the, um, the vehicle. They knew that it was romaine lettuce and they did know the growing region at least because of also, I mean, this is where romaine lettuce is produced at this time of year, but also um, in the traceback investigations, but they could not um, readily pinpoint exactly where it was coming from and had to issue quite broad recommendations on not, um, not consuming um, any romaine coming from the Yuma region. Um, and so, uh, it also took a, quite a bit of time in real time to do these traceback investigations. Um, and that was also very, um, because of that, they had to keep amending their, uh, the regula regulators had to keep amending their um, recommendations to consumers and their, their, um, their recall efforts, which is also less than ideal. Again, this is kind of just summarizing it and it, how it couldn't be resolved in real time and where end-to-end -end traceability and digitized standardized records could be a very, it could be of uh, extreme benefit in, um, in aiding, uh, aiding this process. And one other thing that's touching why it's, traceability is challenging, as I, I did kind of allude to this earlier, is that we have these really shiny objects that are occurring in digital t technology that are very promising, but they also, are not silver bullet solutions, um, especially blockchain, which I will talk about in depth a little bit later if we have time, but also artificial intelligence and advanced analytical techniques and IoT devices all have these potential benefits to enabling end-to-end -end traceability of having much closer data monitoring, um, of having unified methods of sharing data um, and decentralized approaches to data sharing, but um, they are, they do require certain elements. And that's why I talk, started this talk talking about what the core things that we need to know. We need to know what those key data elements are. We need to know what those critical, critical junctures where the data needs to be collected. And we need to have a, we need to have an ability to have global uniqueness on the things that we're tracking. And without those elements, none of these, you know, uh, technologies that um, are coming out are necessarily going to solve that. Um, but they can, if you are, having a standardized approach, and if you are consider having a thoughtful approach to your design, um, that these can be of, of benefit. But it does cloud the conversation somewhat. So that kind of leads me into um, really what GFTC um, brings to benefit for the um, global food industry, which is having the ability to bridge various stakeholders to um, arrive at uh, unified standards and traceability and and, um, and various food commodities. And so I want to go over some of the existing standards that exist for product identity and traceability and just kind of pointing you guys to tools that you may be able or resources you may you may already be aware of them, but um, that you can look at to learn more about what the current thinking of or what the current thinking is in traceability and um, uh, what you can do to further your, your own education. Um, really for product identity standards and linking um, supply chain nodes, there's uh, the Global Standards 1 or GS1 has made significant strides in, um, uh, in having a unified approach to um, global uniqueness on um, logistical units and product identity. Um, they have various working groups and uh, standards that they work on to facilitate this. So as you, uh, probably know they are known for the barcode and the, the G10 and, um, uh, and forming other various identifiers through the purchasing of a company prefix. Um, they are deeply involved in um, various traceability efforts and designing their standards around um, the, uh, the ability to trace back um, various goods, including food. Um, so they have a fresh foods and uh, retail a working group. They also have standards called the uh, Global Traceability Standard, 
uh, EPCAS, which stands for Electronic Product Code Information Services, and Digital Link, which is uh, a new um, a new initiative to ha to really utilize the power of um, of the internet to uh, digitally link records together. Um, uh, I will not really go into greater depth on this because I am trying to be cognizant of time. Um, the Produce Traceability Initiative is an, a uh, traceability initiative that relies heavily on GS1 standards, um, uh, evidenced by one of the major partners being GS1 US. Uh, the um, impetus to this initiative was the 2006 um, E. coli 157H7 outbreak in spinach. Um, in uh, in 2006, so that kind of had this commodity killer effect, where even um, even companies that did not uh, were not implicated in the um, uh, in the outbreak had you know decreased consumption and uh, de decreased business for years. Um, it took up to a decade really to get up to the same consumption uh, that was at its peak. Um, so this is a North American effort. Um, primarily focused on the uh, U.S., uh, Canada, and Mexico to have a unified approach to um, traceability so that they can trace back um, products to its uh, to their source. Um, really, they focused on labeling and identification and how that um, and resolving real technical challenges that they have in the especially in the upstream, which is where it's most challenging to starts, global uniqueness uh, and identification, and to um, have digitized records. Um, and then uh, finally, the, I'll talk a little bit about the global dialogue of TV traceability. This is the effort that um, we are currently working on. Um, we are um, working with uh, an industry a collaboration of 67 or 70 uh, seafood co companies across the world to develop a Unified traceability standard um, in um, to address both uh, food safety and uh, uh, illegal catch. Um, illegal fishing is an extremely uh, large problem in the seafood industry. Um, there, I think, there's been some reports that up to a third of seafood is actually uh, illegal or unregulated or unreported. Um, that's that's globally traded. So um, they had additional key uh, key data elements that needed to be collected in order to um, um, in order to ascertain that product is uh, legitimate and is not fraudulent and um, and they were seeking uh, ways to um, enable interoperability between information systems so we used our methodology which I'll describe a little bit later um, to um, leverage global standards that I previously talked about in order to um, have a, a unified approach. And then finally, I'll kind of speak a little bit more directly to the regulatory side of traceability at the moment. Um, we do know with the smarter era of food safety that um, the, there's going to be a um, movement forward at the, um, at the FDA for um, their approach to um, traceability and writing to that. Um, at, uh, when FISMA was, um, was put into law, the first provision of Section 204 went to effect where FDA contracted with IFT to facilitate an investigation, basically, of what is the landscape of traceability in the United States? What steps does uh, the FDA and the industry as a whole need to take in order to uh, get from a one-up, one one-down system to a more connected and uh, hopefully end-to-end -end system? Um, how do we conceptualize that in a technology-agnostic way? And is there a way for us to, you know, Move the needle a little bit in, um, you know, in solutions to uh, to traceability. So this was a, um, you know, extensive uh, trace, somewhat similar to a traceback investigation, understanding what the product flow um, from the source to the retailer was, and understanding also the data collection needs and the information technology realities. Um, through this, we produce a report uh, which is still being used uh, heavily by. A variety of stakeholders to um, to uh, um, move forward in, in building traceability systems. So finally, I want to go into the technology and applications and traceability, um, which really connects a lot of those key concepts that I was talking about earlier, and the standardization um, that uh, standardization efforts that I was talking about as well. 
So again, think about those fundamental categories of capture um, or identity, capture, and sharing. Um, uh, your identification, you're thinking about unique, identif unique identifiers, digital identifiers. Um, capturing that um, can also be capturing that identity through physical means or through digital means. Um, also capturing additional uh, key data elements that, that should be collected. And then sharing are the um, various data sharing protocols that uh, exist. Um, this can be anything from advanced blockchain or cloud-based systems to, you know, you know, uh, even mailed or emailed records. So just really the idea of sharing traceability information. Um, and then also the use, which is kind of newer in this space, but it's the, the reality is, is that as information collect or digital, as data collection increases, we're going to be able to translate that into information and to uh, analytics to uh, um, to better supply chains, better efficiencies, and also um, better be able to respond to food safety incidents. So here's a little bit more information on identification and what we really mean by that. Um, generally, um, and what you may be mostly familiar with are GS1 identifiers. This is usually the G10 plus lot to get down to the granularity needed for a, um, a recall response. So G10s are made up of a company prefix that our, a company purchases, and then they have they form um, a unique uh, class of uh, of identification for that product um, with uh, with the G1014, and then there's an associated lot, which is an internal identifier to um, to put it with a batch lot production. Um, that can actually be incorporated into an uh, what is called an LG10 or a G10 plus lot, which can be put on a uh, label such as a GS1128. Um, there are also non-GS1 um, ways of unique identification, um, and we're running into this. Often in our um, traceability piloting activities and in our devisement of traceability system of traceability guidance, because the reality is, is that there's not a lot of GS1 penetration upstream, um, especially at the producer at the producer and even up to the primary producer level. There can be uh, a low amount of um, you know there there may be internal identification, but they may not be using um, they may not be using a, a GS1. So um, where companies have made quite a bit of strides in doing end-to-end -end traceability, such as a lot of blockchain companies, uh, other traceability companies, they often will supply their own um, unique identifier and the, their own, um, with basically their own uh, company prefix to that particular supplier, and then um, they use that internally. Um, but externally, when you're wanting to, um, if you wanted to have a unified way of identifying and Ensuring that there's no collision between, um, you know, which may basically means that people are sharing the same identifier. Uh, UUIDs is also another way of of, uh, of doing that. And then encoding that um, that identification should be on um, uh, is is generally done on optical uh, through optical means, namely barcodes. Um, again, because of the amount of GS1 adoption um, and Associated with that, that means there's also a lot of readers, a lot of automated ways of, of picking up that. Um, QR codes are also um, on the rise, um, not as much, especially in high throughput circumstances, but QR codes can be generated and hold a, more information than a, what a barcode can, can hold um, and have a little bit more flexibility and are a little bit more durable. Um, uh, there are also uh, advances to uh, using RFIDs. Um, which are radio frequency identifiers, um, which um, have advantages in that you can read them at a distance. You can also read multiple units at once. You can basically, you know, pass, you know, uh, uh, pass product across an array and would, it would automatically read it. There's been some implementation challenges with uh, the, um, sorry, my, the light, the automatic light. My room just turned off, which is. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, but uh, but they are also uh, there's being more adoption and and that and then there's a couple of other experimental machine readable identification um, mechanisms that have not uh, borne out uh, yet but they're on the rise. Um, so data capture uh, again, that's what I was talking about earlier that there's associated KDEs that will need to also collect that information be and um, and house it with and associate it with that unique identification. 
Um, this is important um, to our efforts because uh, these data need to be collected in a standardized and digitized way um, so that there can be interoperability um, between systems. So if someone is a, a basic, um, you know, basic uh, thinking around this is like, how would you house, you know, temperature readings? Do you house it in, you know, generally at, at Celsius, but you want to make sure that all supply chain partners are using Celsius. Um, you also would want to have a, you know, standardized uh, um, uh, um, 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 what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, have a standardized amount of digits uh, to the and specificity to the temperature. Um, things such as that. So mostly like arriving at the unified syntax and semantics of the pieces of information and then having best collect uh, best practices around that collection of information. So um, anything really can be considered in this in this segment, but namely it's the capturing of the identity and then the associated KDEs that need to be collected. And then data sharing. Um, and this is really important to um, business providers um, or the uh, um, solution providers and their corresponding food companies that they're working with for you know food uh, food safety regulators it's important to kind of know these concepts but it's you know not going to necessarily be part of your your specific needs and uh, trace back but um, this is kind of where there's been a lot of excitement because um, there's you know classically been these uh, ways of sharing business information especially along electronic data interchanges but you know, with the enabling of the internet, HTTPS APIs are very popular, um, and then blockchain also as a, as a mechanism for sharing data um, across supply chain nodes is, is also very popular. Um, but I won't go into that much detail with this. Um, so this is just kind of a, it's kind of a nifty uh, a graph. It's, I, I know it's a little bit cumbersome and a lot of words, um, but what I really want to center this this focus on is that standardization really, especially in the food traceability space, really centers on this this line of sharing and capturing, really in the EPCIS uh, capture interface. That's really the EPCIS is just a uh, file format for encoding uh, logistics information. And standardizing that approach for the use case of the industry is really important so that you can um, really use other standards and protocols you know, at the data capture level and at the data sharing level to um, leverage and enable end-to-end -end traceability. And then finally, um, I kind of talked about this in the introduction, but there's, uh, you know, um, the, the actual use of the traceability information. How should it be housed and shared so that we can have these effective, um, so that we can actually use information for what we want it for? Um, so in food safety and um, traceback investigations, you this may be the the principal data use is going to be you know rapid queryability in the event that it needs to be so uh, for for sustainability and maybe being able to do audit checks or be able to perform a mass balance to ensure that there's the allocation that all of the weight of the product is accounted for throughout each supply chain node um, and also though once you have an uh you know information and aggregator um along the um, supply chain, no matter, you know, if you have more and more information about further upstream of your supply chain, you may also be able to um, make better decisions about um, your purchasing or um, how you do inventory or, um, and also that can feed into your your food safety considerations as well. Um, and then, again, there's a kind of this balance between accountability with business sensitivity. We have seen a shift oh, um, from businesses being extremely sensitive about uh, what is shared to a little bit more of a um, nuanced approach to that they realize that transparency um, in supply chains is going to rise just from happenstance and the um, advancing of technology and these advances in these um, standardization efforts, uh, et cetera. But uh, that does need to be balanced with the um, particular information that may be critical to what gives them a market advantage. Um, just a kind of a take home point is that, you know, we have found that standardization to data elements and IT architectures is critically important to um, enabling end to end traceability and um, enabling solutions to, um, to arise. So 
Um, what we really see standardization as is kind of common rules of the road where technology providers can come in and use those common rules of the road um, to really basically compete on user interfaces, on their ability, their, you know, data security, you know, all these kind of technical considerations, rather than, you know, trying to garner market share in using their proprietary data format or their proprietary way of labeling or, um, or issuing identification. The future technology may change, uh, may change uh, the the reality to traceability, but at the moment, this is the uh, what we have seen, and it will be the the reality for some time, especially as producers become more and more digitized. But that's still um, that's still on the on the rise. So I just kind of want to talk specifically about blockchain. You guys may have heard about it, and I kind of want to dispel kind of some myth, some of the mythology behind it. Um, I want to kind of, and I'm going to keep this pretty short, um, but it has been kind of touted as this ultimate ledger and data sharing arrangement where, you know, everybody has a um, decentralized copy of the ledger that um, sensitive information can be cryptologically, you know, hidden, um, that there can be variable, you know, levels of access using smart contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because of the way of its architecture, it um, uh, it's, uh, uses time stamping and encryption and linked records to um, to ensure that there's this immutability. Um, and uh, so, because it has this kind of decentralized approach, and because it, you know, just as a very promising technology in general and has certain attributes. Um, that has seen, been seen as a very attractive technology to be used in, in food traceability. Um, I will preface this as with the caveats being um, that blockchain is a technology that's born out of the financial technology space. So it works very, very well in Bitcoin and Ethereum and, you know, trading at digital assets. It's, it's when you're trading assets on uh, on a blockchain that only sit on the blockchain, it works very, very well. And um, but when you are tying that to a physical asset, you still a lot of these problems that I was talking about earlier about standardization, about digitization, about you know interoperability still still occur and are still meaningful. Um, uh, additionally, you know, uh, with the technology still in its infancy, there are issues with latency. You know, a long period of time between posting a transaction or posting a data upload and it actually being appended on the blockchain because it has to be resolved um, among all the nodes. Um, error correction can be a problem because if it's immutable, it's not really, it's not something that you can actually go in and delete or amend. You basically would have to, um, and then there's uh, also level visibility. At the moment, a lot of blockchains are mostly set up for fairly radical transparency. Um, and then you still also have some regulatory considerations uh, such as GDPR or um, or gas requirements or requiring the use of cryptocurrency to upload something onto a public blockchain. Those are a little bit less relevant to us because we're in the United States and we're not uh, necessarily thinking about GDPR and um, the gas requirements is a consideration for Southeast Asia. But it's also it's important to note that it's use of cryptocurrency is still being um, explored by various regulatory entities, not just food safety, but in, in financial assets as well. So I kind of want to give you guys some food for thought on how to, um, um, on what some tools and techniques would be useful for you. Um, you know, really centering on familiarizing yourself with um, data standards is really um, something that could be really useful to you. Um, um, the global traceability standard, for instance, at GS1, the, uh, looking at also um, the Produce Traceability Initiative and their approach to standardizing uh, uh, case labeling. Um, and also um, looking at the IFT FISMA report may also be very useful in thinking about um, a system-wide approach to traceability. Um, and then also kind of investigating um, some of the digital aspects of it. Um, really. Thing, I don't think these are necessarily skills that are are required, um, but in the future, having a bit more digital savviness is going to be um, 
going to be essential to being uh, effective in uh, traceback investigations, being familiar with SQL query, uh, queries, uh, being familiar with various um, file formats and how they're transmitted um, may, be, um, may be useful to you. And also kind of understanding where the industry is and what their current, or what their next steps are in designing traceability systems. Um, and I can share some of those some of those resources as well um, in a uh, in a post meeting email. Um, so with that, that's kind of a, a a rapid look at traceability. What we've seen in our um, effort as a convener of global industry players, and where that interplay is between what the industry needs are, what the regulatory needs are, and what um, various interest groups such as sustainability NGOs or food safety advocates. Um, what they um, and converging those into having a unified standards process. Um, I think we have uh, about 10 minutes available, um, and I will leave it to Randy to help us um, lead us through the questions that have arisen. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a question here from James, and the question is: What is the most critical component of traceability in produce? Safety. So the mo um, what we've seen um, in the the most critical um, component is really the identification and the integration between um, the identification at the harvest level and at the commingling level. There has not been there because of the business realities at the harvest level. Um, it is not easy to implement a new process or to implement a new um, labeling requirement that can um, uniquely identify products. And there's also uh, challenges once it gets, gets to the pack house where coming link events may occur. So um, that's still really the, the biggest challenge that we see um, is, you know, uptake of identification schemas and um, and compliance to a standard so that there can be uh, better um, better trace back to the source. I don't know, Brian, if you have any additional thoughts. No, I think that's appropriate. You know, the the produce industry has been on quite a journey, and they've been learning a lot. Um, you know, Thomas highlighted a couple areas that they continue to work through and try to drive you know industry level type of um, Alignment. So, you know, one of the challenges in this space is getting to a, a, a common language and a common set of tools that can be used by everyone in a uh, you know pre-competitive uh, type of environment. So, only the produce industry has been on that journey and continues to be on that journey. I'd like to go ahead and thank Brian and Thomas for making the time to present today, and I'd like to thank everyone else for attending. Um, and that will conclude today's webinar on traceability. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.